Welcome to Heritage Christian University, where making ministers is our ministry and has been so for 56 years. This annual church leadership workshop is an outgrowth of our Heritage Christian Leadership Institute. Started the institute about six years ago and had our first workshop about five years ago. And so far, that institute has produced one, no, two books. And we've got several in the hopper, including a youth and family ministry book that will hopefully come out in the next few months, and eventually an elders, deacons, and teachers books that we're dreaming of down the road. And so it is an effort by this university to assist local churches in what they do in leading and teaching for God's glory. Uh, we often like to say we do more than just offer degrees. We do a lot of continuing education through our books and workshops, etc. And we're grateful for you being a part of today and for the outstanding speakers who are going to share with us in various settings today. We'll mention to you, if you help yourself to the coffee and muffins, uh, Brianna and listen them do not want to take the muffins home, so make sure you eat all of that. Out in the hallway, we have several of our books. A lot of folks don't realize that we have Heritage Press, which is academic, and Cypress Press, which is more church use. But we have a number of books that we produce and publish. In fact, we have our Heritage Press team has just done a curriculum where it takes the various books that we've done and puts them into a five-year curriculum in case your congregation wants to use the book in some kind of order that makes sense. We have a lot of churches that use our books. Some of them are used by teachers for prep. Some are used, a number of churches use ours as their regular Bible class material. So some of those are out in the hall if you are interested in that. I'm grateful to Melissa McFerrin for the work she's put into today. And we've got several of our students helping. I see Dylan back there. Brianna Butler, our Associate Vice President of Marketing and Communication, has done a great deal today. Our entire admissions department overseen by Rebecca Harrison, just a host of folks. Our advancement department headed up by uh, Vice President uh, J.T. Harrison, just a lot of people poured into this. If you hear anybody's voice today, it's going to be because of, because of Caleb Sampson in the back. In fact, Caleb's going to lead the prayer right before Johnny gets up to speak because I said you never get, nobody ever hears your voice or sees your face. So he'll probably do it from back there. But uh, he preached for and taught uh, for many, many years, and we, he's come here and works in our marketing department. So we're excited about today and grateful for your being here. But this day is all about promoting and encouraging leaders in the Lord's church, and I'm excited about the day. In just a moment, Caleb Baker is going to lead us in the verse of a song. Caleb is one of our admissions counselors. He's also a product of our Titus summer camp and undergrad and grad student and now works at the university. If you cut his arm, he bleeds green. For those of you that don't know, green is our school color. So he's going to lead us in a song in a moment. And then after that, uh, Caleb Sampson. Caleb and Caleb will be uh, leading us in that today. And then we'll turn things over to Brother Johnny. Let me go ahead and introduce him. Johnny played 12 seasons in the major leagues. I want to emphasize that some knew him because of his major league career. I knew him because I heard him speak. It was then afterwards that, you know, found out I knew he was going to speak. I knew he was an elder, but the, the, the baseball connection came later. He played 12 seasons in the major leagues, 10 of those with the San Francisco Giants. And on September 2nd, 1975, he set a major league record hitting an inside-the-park home run in his first at-bat during a 7-3 to three win over the Dodgers. And my dad was probably sad. My dad grew up as a Dodgers fan. I don't know how that happened in Kentucky. Many fans will long remember LeMaster for the one game in 1979 when he took the field wearing the phrase on his back that the fans affectionately knew him by, boo. He currently is an elder at the Paintsville Church of Christ in Paintsville, Kentucky, and, of course, I grew up in Kentucky. I have a love for the Lord's church across the world, but in particular in Kentucky. I've had the privilege of hearing him speak on many or several occasions. I know that several of our folks at the Killen Congregation, where we are members, have heard him speak, and we're really excited to find out that you were going to be here today. And so in just a few moments, he's going to talk about, uh, he's, I titled it, he's got a blog called A Short Stop with a Short Stop. 
And so I just gave that title to his talk. But he is a lifelong leader, and most importantly, he's a leader in the Lord's Church, and he's going to share with us from that wealth of knowledge and experience. So I'll turn things over to the two Caleb's. Let's stand as we sing. <clears throat> Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, to see you shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. To see you shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let's pray. Our great and awesome Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here together this morning to be able to sing praises to your name and to be with like-minded individuals and to, uh, to be able to hear from Brother Johnny as he delivers your word. We're thankful for his, uh, his many years of service in your kingdom, uh, both as a Christian and as an elder and as a leader in your church. Uh, Father, we're thankful for his preparation this morning as he brings us the lesson and and as we continue to fellowship throughout the day, and I pray that you bless this event, bless Heritage Christian University, and, and bless your church uh, through all the, the many works that we do. And Father, I pray that you help us to uh, make the changes that we see are necessary uh, in our own lives when we compare it to your word. Help us to uh, see those open hearts and open doors around us and those that are searching for the truth, and may we have... Uh, a compassion to be able to share the glory of what you've done for us. Uh, Lord, I pray that you uh, bless your church with spiritual growth and bless it with growth in numbers and help us to, uh, to never uh, discount your word or to, um, to overlook the power to move in people's hearts and minds. Father, I pray that you continue to give us strength against the attacks of the devil when they come and, and may we always look to your word for guidance and all of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope everyone is feeling good and ready to talk about God's word and uh, two things I need to thank Kurt Brothers for the invitation to be here. Thank you, Brother Kurt. Uh, it's the first time I've ever been here. It's a beautiful building, and I know that you all do a great work. And Caleb Sampson back there that just led the prayer, I got to give a shout out to him because I, I do a podcast called Shortstop with a Shortstop, and he's my design man. He designed the logo, if you've ever watched it or ever seen it. Uh, uh, he, he was the designer of that, and I, I really appreciate that very much. And there's a lot of you out there that I know, and I 
mention everybody's single name or we'll be here all day. But I appreciate you being here. Uh, it's a good thing that you can have uh, fellowship in these type of settings, but yet learn about God's word also. As he said, I played in the major leagues for several years, and but I've been an elder now for almost 29 years. And it's the most important job in the world. And we need to take it very seriously and, and have an understanding of exactly what God wants his shepherds to do here on this earth. Because we have a great shepherd that we're going to answer to at one time. But today, I want to talk to you about when I was playing baseball, when I woke up every morning, the first thing I did was went to go to get the newspaper. And it was the San Francisco Examiner, the San Francisco Chronicle. And I would look at the box score, see if they had exactly what I had done the night before or the day before what my production was. But I would also look at the box scores of the other teams that played. Now I'm gonna ask a stupid question here. Is there anybody that doesn't know what a box score is? One person. All right. For your benefit, <clears throat> I'm gonna show you what a box score is. This was the very first box score or the very first game that I ever played. We were playing the Los Angeles Dodgers. Kurt said he was a Dodger fan. But, okay. But the first game that I played, the very first at bat that I ever had in the big leagues was against Don Sutton. Don's in the Hall of Fame, but he's passed away. But I hit an inside the park home run my very first at bat. And I'll show you something a little bit funny here a little bit later. But you can see the at-bats, the runs, the hits, the RBIs, the walks, the strikeouts, the putouts, uh, the on-base percentage. Uh, all these things would go down, but every baseball player, every athlete lives by their statistics. And if we look in Revelation chapter 20, and verses 12 and 13, and it says, I saw the dead and the great and the small standing before the throne. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things that were written in the books according to their deeds. Brethren, we have a box score that God is keeping. And we're going to answer for it in one way or the other. He's either going to tell us to depart, I never knew you, or he's going to say, enter into the joys of heaven. And we want to make sure that we enter into the joys of heaven. A couple of months ago, I went to a baseball clinic, and the keynote speaker, his name was Daryl Chaney. He was a utility infielder with the Cincinnati Reds. And he was playing on a team that was called the Big Red Machine. And I played against that team, which was called the Big Red Machine, and they were awesome. I mean, they were very, very good. But he was not getting very much playing time. And one day he decided to walk down to his manager's office, which his name was Sparky Anderson, and he knocked on the door. And Sparky said, come on in, Daryl. And Daryl came in and sat down, and, and he looked at, he said, Sparky, I'd like to get a little bit more playing time, which is admirable on, on Daryl Cheney's part. He wanted to be involved. Sparky looked at him, and, and he said, Daryl, he said, <clears throat> he said, at first base, I have a man by the name of Tony Perez. So he leads our team's and RBIs every year. I can't afford to, to sit him down. And he went on, he said, at second base, he said, I got Joe Morgan. 
He said he steals more bases than anybody on the team. He's been the MVP of the National League the last two years. He said, I can't afford to sit him down either. And he goes on. <clears throat> he says, I got Davey Concepcion at shortstop. He's been an all-star shortstop for the past five years. I really can't afford to sit him down either. And he goes on. He says, I got Pete Rose at third base. He said he's leading the world in batting average, base hits. He's been an all-star for thir the last 13 years. He said, I really cannot afford to sit him down. And he goes on. He said, in right field, I got Ken Griffey. This was Ken Griffey Jr.'s dad. He was out in right. He's an all-star. He said, I can't afford to sit him down either. He said, out in the center field, I got Cesar Geronimo. He's an all-star. He's a gold glove winner. The last three years, he's won the gold glove. I cannot afford to sit him down. And he goes on. He said, I got George Foster out in left field. He's led the league in home runs the last two years, and he's an all-star. He said, I can't afford to sit him down either. He goes on. He said, I got Johnny Bench. He said, if he gets hurt, I probably won't put you behind the plate to catch anyway. But after Sparky got through saying all this, Daryl said, he said, I felt bad for even coming in there and asking anything. <laughs> he said, I got up and walked to the door, and Sparky, he said, Daryl, come on back here and sit down a minute. And, oop, wrong one. And Sparky said, listen, if... He, if, if Tony Perez goes down, he says, I'm going to put you at first base. He says, if Joe Morgan gets hurt or can't play or gets sick, I'm going to put you at second base. He said, if Davey Concepcion gets hurt, I'm going to put you at shortstop. If Pete Rose gets hurt, you're the first man that's going to third base. All three of the outfitters, he says, if any one of them get hurt, or can't play, I'm going to put you out in the outfield. And Sparky says, you don't understand really how important that you are. Three days after he goes into the manager's office and is asking for some more playing time, Davy Concepcion broke his ankle. And Daryl Chaney played for the rest of the year. But how many of us go into our elders and say, I want to play. I want to be a part of the church. Can I pick up garbage? Can I sweep the auditorium? Can I teach a Bible class? Can I get involved in vacation Bible school? Can I help during gospel meetings? How many of us are like a Daryl Cheney willing to go in and say, hey, I want to play, coach. But let me flip it on the other side. How many elders tell their congregation, their people, how important that they are so that they never forget it? It's a very important thing that the leadership of every congregation tells their members that they are important. Because if you look at Ephesians 4.16, every part does its share, causes growth of the body and the edifying of itself in love. Somebody may be the feet of the Lord in that congregation. Somebody may be the knees that gets down and scrubs the floors. Somebody may be the hands of the Lord. Somebody may be the shoulders that carry somebody around. Somebody may have that head that can use wisdom and intelligence. But every single person in that congregation should have a part to play. But it's up to that leadership to get those people involved in the work of the church. Leaders, what is your box score going to look like when it comes to getting your people involved? <clears throat> I didn't flip my pages here. Be there. 
Some of you may remember Reggie Jackson, some of you may not. <clears throat> he talked about, Kirk talked about a while ago about uh, me wearing boo on the back of my jersey, and I did. But let me ask you all a question. Have any of you all ever been booed by 50,000 people? <laughs> I have. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It don't feel good. It will raise the hair on the back of your neck. What does an athlete want to do? Who's, who does he want to please the most? And that's his hometown fans. He wants them to be happy. He wants them to clap for him. But if they boo for him, it's the most awful feeling in the world. I was, I'd made a few errors. I'd struck out a few times. The people started booing on a regular basis. And I'm going to put my wife on the spot here. We were laying in bed one night in San Francisco and I thought she was asleep have you ever been to a morgue where something scares you you think this person is laying on a slab and they're passed out dead well, my wife pops up she says why don't you just change your name to boo <laughs> I don't know where that come from and she's sitting over here smiling I'm sure but I went the next day and told my <clears throat> equipment manager to make me a jersey up with boo on the back of it, and he did. It took me a couple of weeks to build up the nerve to wear it, but I finally did. <clears throat> but before, it, when they are announcing the starting lineups, they, we run out of the dugout one at a time. But I had a jacket on, so nobody, there was only one person that knew I had it on. And he was a utility infiller by the name of Rob Andrews. But I had the jersey on. I had a, a, a heavy jacket on. But just as soon as they announced my name on the intercom, then I ran out of the dugout. But Rob was standing by our manager by the name of Joe Altabelli. And Rob said Altabelli couldn't see good. He, he looked out. He said, what's he got Bob on the back of his jersey for? <laughs> but I only got to play three out defensively wearing the, I never got a bat with it on. My equipment manager that had made it for me, when I got to the dugout, there was sweat coming down his face. He had a regular jersey for me to put on. He said, you have just got me fired. And our general manager literally fired him at that moment. He, believed, he later gave him his job back. But at the end of the game, where do you think all the reporters' mics were at? At my locker, I'll bet you there was 30 different mics in front of my face asking me about the boo jersey. But here's the great thing about it. The media loved it. The fans loved it. If somebody's going to be that crazy to do something like that, we got to like him. So what I'm telling you, leadership, don't do things as crazy as I did, but don't be ever afraid to take a chance to make your congregation as good as it can possibly be. But this guy here, Reggie Jackson, <clears throat> he was a teammate of mine the last year I played. We were up in Seattle and we had a day game that day and I got up early to go eat breakfast. I was down in the restaurant by myself eating. And <clears throat> Reggie, Poked his head around the corner. He said, hey, John, are you eating by yourself? I said, yeah, Reggie, come on over here. We'll eat together. So we were sitting there eating, and all of a sudden he just looks at me, just stares me right in the eye. He said, I hear you get booed every once in a while. I said, yeah, Reggie, I do. He said, I understand this one thing right here. He said, people don't boo nobody. Now, why he said that to me, I'll never know. But you know what it did for me? It made me feel like a million bucks. He, he said, hey, I get booed too. He said, just about everybody that's ever played any professional sport is going to get booed at one time. But he was there for me. He made me feel good. And that's what we need to do as leaders with our congregation. We need to make them feel as good as we possibly can, even when things are going bad for them. And there was another young man. His name is Mark Davis. 
<clears throat> he was with the Philadelphia Phillies. He got traded to the San Francisco Giants. One of his first starts that he had with us, he gave up eight runs in the top of the first inning. Didn't get nobody out. Frank Robinson was the manager at that time. He goes out and takes him out. When the game's finally over, his locker was real close to mine. I go in and he's got his bag. I mean, he had everything in his locker packed up. I said, Mark, what are you doing? He said, I quit. He said, I can't play at this level. I'm just not good enough. And I sit there and talk to him for a half hour, 45 minutes. Didn't get religiously to the last five minutes. And I told him, I said, what if Jesus Christ gave up? What if he got to the cross and said, hey, I'm not going to do it? And after that, he, he kind of simmered down a little bit. And he went home, came back the next day. He eventually got traded to the San Diego Padres. But in 1989, this turkey right here was the Cy Young Award winner of the National League. He signed a multi-million dollar contract. The turkey didn't even give me a penny of it. <laughs> Attendance. We all know what Hebrews 10.25 says and 10.24. One of the reasons that I brought this up is because people are looking at it virtually nowadays. I, I don't know I know that there's good and that there's bad that comes with it it's good that people may be shut-ins people in the hospitals, people that are sick people that are traveling can have an opportunity to uh, watch a worship service but there's some bad that comes with it too Unfortunately, there's people that will sit at home in their pajamas and lazy boys and really not participate when they could actually be at the worship service. And I honestly don't know yet exactly how to fight this. We have been preaching on it and preaching on it and preaching. We're not using it as a soapbox sermon every Sunday morning, Sunday night type of thing. But as an elder, it should bother us. We should have compassion. We should want to tell these people that Hebrews 10.25 is not a suggestion, but it's a command. Because when we meet together, it builds us up. It provokes us to love. It helps every other person in the congregation when we are there. But... In Acts chapter 2 and verses 46 and 47, I had a, a member of the church, I, we were just, he said, why don't we just go back and meet like they did in the first century? But if you look in Acts chapter 2 and verse 46, they were going to the temple daily. They were meeting every day. It wasn't just a, a once on a Sunday thing. They were going every single day and meeting. And I want to, I go to Peru, I go to Uganda. I just got back from Peru not long ago. There are people there that walk five miles to come to worship service because they can't afford to pay a bus fare or a cab fare and they don't have a phone, I mean a car. And they walk. Let me ask you all a question. Would you walk five miles to worship service and be glad to? How spoiled are we? I go to Uganda. There's people there that walk at least five miles to come to worship service. It's some place that we are supposed to be and that we should be, but we're going to have a box score when it comes to our attendance. I just want, that's probably a question that may come up later, and if it does, we'll be glad to talk about it again. <clears throat> oh, I forgot.
If you'd turn to Second Samuel with me. And this is David uh, talking with the king Anara. And it says, Then Anara said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar for the Lord that the plague may be held back from the people. And Arna said to David, let my lord the king take up and offer what is good in the sight. Look, the oxen for the burnt offering, the threshing sleds and the oaks for the oxen and the wood, everything old King Arna gives to the king. And Arna said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. However, King David said to Arna, no, but I will surely buy it for you for a price. For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God now listen to this, which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Our worship service should cost us something. It should cost us our time. If we give on the first day of the week like we're supposed to, it should cost us our money too. Attendance is very, very important. Sacrifice. I hate to say this, but in the big leagues nowadays, they don't know how to bunt. They're just looking to try to hit home run after home run after home run. You used to, you would see an infield shift and they'd leave that whole third base side completely wide open and nobody would even try to bunt one down through there. And the object of the game is to get on base and try to score a run. But they were thinking of just about trying to uh, hit home run after home run after home run. But if you would turn with me to 2 Samuel 23, verses 15 and 16. This has always struck me very, it's always hit a chord with me. Uh, <clears throat> this is talking about King David again. He's out with some of his army men and David just makes a statement but I want you to listen to how these three mighty men take this statement in David was then in the stronghold with the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem David had a craving and says anybody ever had a craving for a three musketeers or a Reese cup or maybe a sweet tea maybe a hamburger well David had a craving Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Now, I have no idea what kind of water that was, but it must have tasted it, a vian or uh, any type of water that uh, would taste good. It must have not had sulfur water or anything like that in it. But verse 16, so the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew the water of the well of, from Bethlehem which by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it. He poured it out to the Lord. He just had a, a, a wham. But those three mighty men loved their king so much that in him just saying something in passing, they were willing to go down and give their lives up. The Philistines were down there in Bethlehem. They had to go down there and fight their way through, get to that well. I don't know whether they had to drip a, drop a bucket or the water was at the top where they could just, but somebody had to get the water while the other two were fighting. And then they had to make it back up there and they got their king a drink of that water, but he wouldn't drink because it would have cost them something. Do you ever hear things that our Lord and Savior, our great shepherd says? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Does that just go over top of our heads? Our attendance, our sacrifice? These three men didn't let, oh, I wish I had a drink of water from the well of Bethel. That didn't just go over the top of their heads. They had a love for their king. 
We have the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. What is your box score going to look like when it comes to what you sacrifice for the great shepherd? I just put this up there for a joke to let you all know that that's what I took when I first at bat. <laughs> Joe Morgan. He signed as a free agent with the San Francisco Giants. Uh, and when I got the news, I went to our equipment manager and there was an empty locker and I said you put his equipment next to mine because we're going to be the double play combination we need to talk to each other and I want to learn as much from him as I possibly can because he had been the MVP uh, twice he'd won two World Series he'd been in the thick of things uh, throughout his whole career when he was playing with the big red machine and when he got there when we would get into the seventh, eighth, and ninth inning of a game, and it was really tight, it may be scores tied or we're up by one or maybe down by one, there might be a real quick runner on first. And Joe would just look over at me and say three words. But I knew exactly what he meant. I knew exactly. He'd say, we got to go. But what did it mean? That means if there was a ground ball hit to me, I was going to get it to him at second base. He was going to stay there and take his punishment of the runner sliding into him and complete the double play. But he expected the exact same thing. If a ball was hit to him, he was going to get it over to me. I was going to stay there, let the runner slide into me, body block me, whatever, complete the double play because the game was on the line. But in the game of life, every single day is the seventh, eighth, and ninth inning. There are people today <clears throat> that will not be living tomorrow. There are people in the hospitals that will not be living tomorrow. There may be some of our family members that may not be living tomorrow that are not New Testament Christians. We got to go. In Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. We got to go. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20 says, You will know them by their fruits. If, a Christ, if in the Old Testament everything produced after its kind, if a Christian produces after himself, what are we supposed to produce? That'd be another Christian. I know we're supposed to have caring, compassion, uh, love, all those good things that go with it. But we're supposed to produce other Christians, to be able to conduct Bible studies. What is our box score going to look like when it comes to the fruit that we have produced. I don't know, I don't see a whole lot of young people out here, but I put this up there uh, just for you all. Oop. It's not on there, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. There was a, short, the shortstop with Cincinnati Reds. When I grew up, I watched the Cincinnati Reds. I idolized them. Uh, it was the closest major league baseball team to my area. So Davies Concepcion was a shortstop when I was coming up through high school. And I tried to pattern a lot of my play after him. And I got to the big leagues, and I'm out there. I'm talking to Davy Concepcion around the uh, batting cage. I'm a New Testament Christian. But I, I said, Davey, I'm going to get a ball, and I want you to sign it and sign it to me. He said, no problem. So he had to go in, so I got a bat boy, sent it over to his locker room, and Davey signed it, and he signed one of the nicest notes that you've ever seen from another shortstop to another shortstop. 
and I've still got the ball. And after the game that night, me and my wife, we went out to dinner, and there was about 12 of my family that were at dinner with us. And it was a, we went out on a boat on the Ohio River. It was called the Islands. It was a really, it was a five-star restaurant. It was a really nice restaurant. We're sitting there eating, and all of a sudden, the Major D with the white towel over his arm, he walks over to our table, and he's got a bottle of wine over his arm. And I said, I didn't order that. He said, I know. Mr. Davy Concepcion has sent this over to you. You all want to talk about peer pressure? I just asked him to sign a ball for me. He told him he was my idol. He sends me a bottle of wine. What are you going to do? The 12 people at my table, there's 24 eyes look like laser beams going right through me. What are you going to do? Peer pressure. I sent the bottle back. I didn't take it. I went and told Davy Concepcion the next day why. Eight of those people that were sitting at that table, I baptized my family, my mom, my dad, my brother, his wife, his two kids, my first cousin, and her son. Now, it, wasn't, it was not because I turned down that bottle of wine. It took me 20 years to convert my mom and dad, or me and the Lord. The Lord did it. I just planted some seed. But I can't help but look back and think, what would have happened if I would have taken that bottle of wine? That might have changed history. I don't know. But I often think about that. I often think about that. Shortstop with a shortstop. What is our box score going to look like when God opens the books? Thank you for allowing me to be here today and being such a great audience. Get it out of the way here in a minute. Does anybody <laughs> think you hit a home run? I knew we would be blessed by his message today. And I'm, I'm grateful both of you can be here. And I'm excited about getting to spend some time with you today. And I hope you're blessed by your time here. We've already been blessed. If we load it up in our cars, please don't. But if we load it up in our cars now, we've been blessed for having been here. We're getting ready now to have our breakout classes. We'll have five breakout classes. We'll come back in here for a panel discussion. There'll be six on the panel. And then Dwayne Tapscott, a preacher, as well as one of our admissions counselors, will be emceeing that group. And then we will have lunch in here, and Dale Jenkins will be speaking to us, and we'll also be recognizing some elders and deacons. So let me tell you where the classes are so you'll know where to go. In the, uh, Dr. Ed Gallagher is going to stay in here. Dr. Gallagher has his doctorate from Hebrew Union. He's been teaching here for many years. And he teaches text, ministry, languages. He is also one of the preachers at the Shared Avenue Congregation downtown, and a part of his work as one of the ministers is he oversees their education program. And a number, he writes a pretty good bit of their adult curriculum, and so we have been publishing that. Our Heritage Press group the committee spoke to him a few years ago about turning the material he was producing for Sherrod into something that other churches could use, and some of that is out on the table. So he's going to be doing a lesson in here on directing education programs and curriculum development. And so that'll just, you can stay here in the auditorium for that. 
Brother Master is going to be in the Posey Room. He's going to be looking at coaching tips for elders, so it'll be a class especially focused on elders. If the Posey Room, three of these classes are going to be in the hall, the other side of that big Franklin Auditorium sign. In other words, if you go out either one of these back exits and come back into that back hallway, you'll see the Posey Room, or it's also known as Room 12. But that is where uh, Brother Master's class for elders is going to be and grief ministry we've got ron and don williams with us ron preaches at the lincoln congregation in huntsville don is a deacon over just uh, across town and also is the former director of the north alabama children's home both of them have become grief specialists they've done education training have a wealth of experience 20 years plus how many years have y'all been doing the grief ministry things? I was 34, I wasn't even close. And so they are both here doing workshops. Ron is going to be in our conference room, which is just off our cafeteria. So the cafeteria is right here behind me on the other side of the hall, and there's an entrance from that cafeteria into the conference room, and he's going to be doing more of a general grief ministry class. Don is going to be down in room 9, which when you go out that door and hang a right, it's the classroom you're going to run directly into. And he is going to be focusing more on those who are doing funerals. So grief ministry through funerals, especially those who preach funerals and work in that environment. So I wanted you to understand the difference in what they are focusing on. Anything y'all would add to that that would provide any clarification that give enough for you, Ron? Okay. And then also, Dr. Rosemary Snodgrass. Dr. Snodgrass has taught for us many, many years here. She is semi-retired right now. Uh, she has a master's and a doctorate in counseling education from University of North Alabama. She's a licensed professional counselor. She is also a, ni a national licensed counselor. And so she has years of both learning, teaching, and living experience in the area of counseling. Her husband serves as one of the elders at the Shared Avenue Congregation. And last year at our alumni days, she did a ladies' class on boundaries. And my wife just raved about it and said, all ladies, in fact, she said, all men need to hear this class. And so I immediately reached out to Dr. Snodgrass and asked if she would do a presentation today. And so she will be in room 10. So again, if you go out the door and then take a right, when you get to the corner, instead of going straight ahead to room 9, turn right, and the room right there as you turn is going to be room 10, and that is going to be her classroom. So we'll dismiss in just a moment to go there. Brother Stan, Dean, you have the voice to pray from there, and we can all hear it. Would you lead us in a prayer? and then we'll be dismissed to our classes. By the way, let me remind you, I know in particular in Ron's class, take your notepad and your pen with you when you go to class. You probably wanna do that for all of them, but in particular, he has some things you'll do. Brother Stan. Thank you, Brother Stan. Thank you.